SmackDown had Sami Zayn and Solo Sokoa versus Rick Shea and Madcap Moss, which... Man, this Sammy and Solo were total baby faces here, and they were well. They're in Canada, Ricochet, and, booing Madcap, booing. The, I well, mean, you was, know, I mean, it, you know, you go against somebody like that, and um, you know, I mean, you go against Sammy in Canada, and you're going to get booed, and they know it, and it's not a surprise, and it's, I mean, they, you know, so, Solo and Sammy still worked as heels, and but yeah, Ricochet and Madcap got booed, just like. Um, you know, B-Fab got booed at the house shows going against Natalia. Same thing. It's just, that's just, that's how it works. You know, um, and, you know, Sammy was super over in all the Canadian sh- at all the Canadian shows this week. So Solo got the win, and then afterwards they did an angle where Sammy Zayn wants to head into the locker room, but he gets stopped by Jey Uso, and Jay tells him, I don't trust you, and he figures he's going to try to screw the family at some point, and Sammy did not deny this. So uh, we'll see where they go with that. I know it's it's interesting because you know everybody kind of sees and expects something, you know, like because a lot of people I think want Roman Reigns and Sammy to do a match down the line, um, just because they see Sammy is doing so well in this role, and he is really great in the role, and you know. Um, We'll see. I mean, I could, like we talked about before, I think that I could see Kevin Owens and Sammy as a team against the Usos easier than the idea of Roman against Sammy as this big program. But I do think the people will, or a lot of the people will buy it. And if you're, if they're going to do something, I mean, they could do like a major show in Canada, they, but they don't have any pay-per-views lined up in Canada, I don't think. But if they did Roman Reigns and Sammy on one of them, I mean, that that would probably do... Um, as far as crowd reactions, it would do really well. We had a quick Drew McIntyre Austin Theory match, which was basically just an angle to set up a tag match in the main event when uh, Kevin Owens, Johnny Gargano, Theory, McIntyre, they all got involved and set that up for later on. They all laid out the uh, heels in this segment. Max Dupree, uh, we learn later, has broken up with maximum male models. Basically said. I'm not into this, and I don't think I ever was. And he throws his belt down with the Maximum Male Models logo on it. And uh, I don't know if he's going to ch- go back to the old name, but he's certainly no longer with Maximum Male Models. I wouldn't be surprised if he went back to L.A. Knight. I, I, but would they do anything with him? Well, I think they would do more with him than Vince was going to do with him because Vince essentially basically fired the guy. Well, yeah, yeah, Vince didn't, which surprises me to a degree because, you know, um, because the guy can talk. I mean, that's the one thing. Um, We'll see what Hunter thinks about him. Yeah, I don't know if he, but, you know, as, as a wrestler, I mean, it's not that he's bad, but he's not really what I would call like WWE top star level. And right now they do judge, you know, they, they do judge on on your work more than any time in history um so that could be could be tough i mean but again yeah if if hunter likes him and uh the guy can talk we'll see um but the uh i i'm i'm I've, i've gotten to the point now where Maximum male models to me are entertaining jobbers but they are jobbers well you know they've I mean? been like that since day one well, not right away, but you know, because they they were being kind of pushed at the very beginning. And well, they got I mean, TV time, but I I don't think they've ever. I I could not consider anything that's ever happened to them a push. Yeah. Anyway, they're total jobbers now. Hit row beat Los Lotharios. Just a quick match there, and then we had we had video packages throughout the show hyping up all the matches, Extreme Rules, and then we had Ronda Rousey beating Natty. They went about three minutes. And it was all right for three minutes. There were a, a couple of moments where they looked like they were on different pages. But uh, Ronda got her with the ankle lock. And then they did everybody's favorite angle, which is Ronda Rousey is leaving, and Liv Morgan all of a sudden is standing there in the aisle. And Liv Morgan has a baseball bat. And they stare at each other for a while, and then Liv Morgan runs at her with a bat, and Ronda Rousey beats her ass. And she beats her up, and she beats her up, and they have a brawl, and 
Uh, they gave Liv Morgan a little bit, but then Ronda beats her ass again. And then all the security comes down to break him up. And then Liv attacks Ronda from behind as she's being carted away by security. They brawl again. And I certainly did not leave this segment thinking that Liv Morgan's got any chance at this pay-per-view. And then Ronda did a promo later, basically, actually it was earlier, saying that uh, she said, I'm the most dangerous unarmed woman on earth, so imagine what I can do with a baseball bat. Shouldn't they have put that after that segment? Well, I think they needed to because, in fact, unarmed, she beat the hell out of Liv Morgan with a baseball bat. So that pretty much answered the question as to what could happen at this show. And I don't think that's what we were supposed to think was going to happen, but that's what they did. We had a segment where Kevin Owens ran into Sami Zayn, and he looks at Sami. Sami looks at him, and Owens looks at him and says, you need a new shirt, and he walks off. So they're teasing them getting together at some point, but it looks like it's going to be a, a long one. Well, it should be. I mean, they certainly, shouldn't, they certainly should not rush into that one. So we had an Imperium promo, and Sheamus ends up interrupting. And, of course, they're going to have the Intercontinental title match coming up. And so Sheamus and notes ne- that... Next Friday is the rematch of, like, the best WWE match of the year. Yeah. So he notes that Butch and Ridge are stuck in Florida, but that's okay because he is here in Winnipeg and he wants a fight. And so he's got a shillelagh, he beats up Vinci and Kaiser, he gets in the ring, he faces off with Gunther, he throws the shillelagh down, and they get into a brawl. And they start beating the hell out of each other, but Kaiser and Vinci show up again, they beat down Sheamus, and essentially they, they beat him down and then they start to leave. And then Seamus does a deal where he, he gets to his knees and he says, Is that all you got? And so they storm back to the ring and they beat him down a second time and they hit him with a the shillelagh. They leave him for dead. So a uh, heavy heat angle here to set up the title match coming up next week. I think Seamus can win this one. He may. Seamus is, you know, it's funny because... Um, Sheamus got really hot off that match in Card- Cardiff. I mean, every building that, that I get reports from, um, Sheamus is really over as a baby face. Well, you know. pull the trigger for a while. Yeah. Um, and, you know, uh, Gunther can lose. He can lose the match, and they can go and do, you know, a feud. It'd be, it'd be good. It sure would be good, because yeah. the first match was great. Yep. We had uh, Michael Cole alerting us to breaking news, that being the death of Antonio Inoki. And they offered their condolences. Corey Graves actually said that Inoki was the first Japanese WWE world champion. But he said the reign was embroiled in controversy. But nobody, he said, would ever forget his fight with Muhammad Ali. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I think people would like to, but that's another story. But um, and it is funny that they acknowledged it because in their own history, it's been erased. Like they, there was a, for a long time, they acted like it never happened for years and years and years. Then there was a period where they had it in their lineage and they took it out again. So, well, you got a new guy in charge, and maybe he's back in the lineage for all I know. He might be. He might. I know. We have to wait to look at the the official lineage. Yeah. We had Bailey beating Shotzi, who got her tank back, and beat her with the rose plant. Then she goes outside, she gets a ladder, she brings it to the ring, and Bianca runs down to make the save. And uh, first, Bailey flees, and so Bianca goes to help Shotzi, but then Bailey runs back, and she's trying to hit uh, Bianca with something onto the ladder, but Bianca reverses, goes for the KOD. Bailey grabs the ropes, ends up outside, flees. So that sets up their ladder match as well. And then the main event of the show was Drew McIntyre, Johnny Gargano, Kevin Owens versus Austin Theory and Alpha Academy. They only got about 10 minutes, but it was a very good match. And McIntyre got the big hot tag. They did a bunch of brawling outside. Owens and Gargano, double super kick on Otis, put him through the announcer's table. Gable goes to make the save. And then uh, Owens hits Gable with the stunner on the table. 
Uh, McIntyre hits Theory with the Claymore, which actually the timing was off because they're showing uh, the table spot. And all of a sudden you see this big pop and they go back to the ring and Theory's already down. So um, I presume my uh, my show ended up at, uh, at 9.55. They went off the air like five minutes early and went to, to something else. So I presume they were just rushed for time. Uh, McIntyre uh, grabs the strap and whips Theory as the show goes off the air. And uh, it's a good show. I mean, you know, everything's just basic, solid booking leading to a pay-per-view. It's the exact same way that Triple H used to book NXT. I mean, those NXT TV shows, I mean, people liked them, but they were not always exciting. They were sometimes just basic. Here's what we're doing. We're building up these matches. Basic, basic, basic. And then they would do this great takeover, and they would go back to basic booking again. So, Well, you know, the thing is... is, is like you don't want to do 100% basic because but basic should be your um like framework you know what i mean it's like your your main stuff basic should, should be the basics of your show right it should be the basics of your show but then you do some things that aren't basics that are you know risks and and you know things out of the box and stuff like that just because you don't want to be completely predictable but you know it's like you're building somebody like like just as an example like uh for AEW this week with Roosh and, and Adam Page, right? It's like, we all know what the concept of this match is, is that Adam Page should win a really good match, and Roosh is there to give him a really good match. Um, that's what they should do. That's probably what they will do. Some people will complain that's too predictable. But if they did anything but that, wouldn't that be to build up the match with Moxley? Um, that would be kind of stupid. So you probably shouldn't do anything but the basics in that one. But sometimes, you know, sometimes you want to do some surprises, too, and, and uh, you know, get a little bit of everything. Hey, if you're a big fan of Wrestling Observer Radio, we got 12,000 episodes of all of our podcasts up at our website, WrestlingObserver.com. If you sign up today, you get access to every single one of them. The 12 to 18 new shows that we do every single week, you can podcast them, listen to them on the road, at work, working out, in the shower, wherever you listen to your podcasts, and also full access to the Wrestling Observer newsletter and archives. So if you love what you hear, head to WrestlingObserver.com, 12,000 audio shows at your fingertips.